Welcome back, warrior. So today is our, uh, we're taking, we're making space for Easter and we're making, today is going to be our Wednesday. We're going to call it Worship Wednesday. And we're going to continue the teaching of Jesus Christ from the Red Hood Hostess study guide. Uh, but then we're also going to read the Living Christ because I thought that that would be a special thing to do on Wednesday. So, <coughs> so it's like great idea. So here we go. We're on Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, or verses 14 to 30. Also new thing today for Sister Weiniger is these. What can I say? Uh, everything looks better with these on. <laughs> it was, I was at the store and I was just, you know, waiting for a prescription or something, uh, for one of my kids. I think it was like during Christmas or something. And I was looking at the glasses and I was like, you know, I haven't had glasses since I was 19 or 20 ish or something. And I was like, maybe we should look to see if we need glasses. So I put them on and I was like, what a difference. I can see words and they're not blurry. Um, it's like they're fuzzy, but they're not blurry. I don't know. Like fuzzy and blurry might be the same. Um, everything just looks better with these on. Now, obviously it needs to be semi close because otherwise then it is blurry because the rest of the, everything else is blurry. But, um, I wonder if this is going to help me not yawn as much because I wonder if my brain was just trying too hard to try and read the words. I don't know. So we'll just, we're just going to see how it goes um, with the reading. But I can definitely tell you right now that the words look crisp or at least crisper than they used to look crisp. Yep, pretty crisp. <laughs> and it's actually pretty amazing. So anyway, here we go. So verses 14, well, right now, okay, hold on. First, we're going to read this piece here. It says, so Matthew chapters, oh boy, this light is not going to be good on our video. Okay. Uh, these chapters contain more teaching, more teachings of Jesus in Jerusalem during his last week. So Matthew's 20, Matthew chapters 24 and 25. We, we will only cover the parable of the talents. Matthew 24 and 25, 25 are known as the Olivet Discourse because Jesus instructed his disciples upon the Mount of Olives. Here is a list of the things that Jesus taught about in these chapters. Okay. <clears throat> So in verse 24, signs of the second coming, then in, uh, or chapter 24, then in chapter 25, 1 to 13, the parable of the 10 virgins, then 14 to 30, the parable of the 10 of the talents, then 31 to 46, the parable of the sheep and the goats. So Jesus tells the parable of the talents to his apostles with whom he is about to entrust his church, his priesthood keys and gospel. Well, no, I guess the yawning is still going to happen. The, the apostles and all the children of God will one day give an accounting on how they discovered, developed, and used their talents and opportunities. This parable illustrates God's generosity in sharing his talents with his children. You know, I never really realized that he meant, that he said, or that God is sharing his talents with us. I mean, they're God-given talents, but I never really put it together that they are God's skills and talents that he's giving to us because that kind of changes things don't you think um i think it i think it changes things a little bit when you think of it that way okay so here we go 14 and 15 huh. for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Okay, uh, 14 to 15. A man, the man in this parable, leaving on a long trip into a far country, is Jesus Christ. He is giving this parable during the last week of his mortal life. After his resurrection and ascension, he will deliver unto the apostles his goods, or property, because he was leaving, this man was entrusting his belongings to his servants. Huh. In New, Test in New Testament times, a talent was a coin worth a lot of money. In this parable, it represents how we are to use the stewardships God has given us 
to help build his kingdom. In this parable, <clears throat> the man gives five talents to one servant, two talents to another, and one talent to another. The different amount of money distributed to the servants is given according to his several ability, meaning they were entrusted with the amount the master best felt they were each capable of managing. Okay. Um, in the Ensign August 2003, Elder Ronald A. Brasman said, The Lord made it clear that it is not good enough for us simply to return to him the talents he has given us. We are to improve upon and add to our talents. He has promised that, that if we multiply our talents, we will receive eternal joy. End quote. Mm, like that. Okay. And then we're going to read Matthew 16 to 18. It says, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. So the five became ten. Then, in verse 17, and likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two, or other two, so two became four. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So, whew, one stayed one. After a long time, the Lord of the servants cometh and reckon, reckoneth with them. <clears throat> okay. Um, the money given to the servants is not their own. It belongs to the master. He entrusted it to them. What did they do with it? The servants that received five and two talents showed how much they valued the talents. They worked hard to put them to use. They invested and traded them. The talents grew into 10 talents and four talents. So um, that's so true, I guess, you know, that the Lord doesn't intend to leave us the same way that he found us or the same way that we found him, <laughs> right? Because he knows where we are. We just sometimes are lost ourselves. Okay, and then verse 20 to 23. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, the Lord, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I, gain, I have gained beside them five talents more. So five plus five. And then his Lord said unto him, so this was the report. And his Lord said unto him, well done, that good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. So this was the reward. The, uh, we get the praise for being a faithful servant. Um, He's going to make us ruler over many things and we will be able to enter in the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I gained two other talents beside them. So now he has four. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Okay, so... After a long time, the master returns and requires an accounting. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, the glasses don't help us with the yawning. Okay, we have, that was our hypothesis and it did not work out. Um, okay, the master returns and requires an accounting of what they did with the talents he gave them. Notice the interaction between the master and each of the servants. The reunion and the accounting of the first two servants is filled with joy and celebration. They both doubled their talents. One produced 10 talents and the other produced four. The generous master rewards both servants. Nice. Okay, then verses 24 to 30. Then he which had... Honestly. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not. And gather where I have not sh where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, 
and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall he, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm. Okay, so then it says, before the third servant makes a report of his lack of performance, he attempts to deflect the attention away from his lack of effort by attacking his master's character. He claims the master is a hard man because he asks his servants to engage in the work and requires an accounting for their efforts. Notice that the first two honest, diligent servants did not share this view. They respect their master enough to do something productive with the talents, trusting that he would require a report of their efforts. In verse 26 to 27, the master sees through the excuses, of course, clearly assessing the real situation, which was the servant's disobedience and laziness. He further questions the rationale by asking if you knew I was going to require a report from you, at the very least, you could have invested the money and gotten some interest, or usury is what they said, in return. He should have done something. The master's actions in response to the lazy, selfish inaction of the third servant in verse 29 is an eternal truth. Nephi reiterates this truth, for unto him that receiveth I will give more, and from them that shall say, we have enough from them shall be taken away, even that which they have. Second Nephi 28, 30. Oh, man. <clears throat> so reading that kind of reminds me of this. Um, first, well, first of all, I want to cover how we're, how, how the servant was assuming what the master, who the master is and, and what his character is, right? He was... He was just assuming his character. He wasn't, he didn't really know him because if he would have known him, then he would have shown that respect. Right. And so I feel like he was showing fear. He wasn't showing any kind of relationship or, or knowledge of, of his master at all. Um, and so instead he tries to, yeah, deflect his attention away, but not so much deflect, but like trying to blame the master and like, like not trying to take ownership or responsibility for the fact that he didn't do anything with the talent, right? Um, and whether he was afraid of the master or not, you know, it kind of shows a little bit like, like that fear, you know, because, um, where is it? He said, <clears throat> he was afraid. So, so we know that there was fear in, in that, in, in that servant's eyes. He was scared of the master. And sometimes I think our relationship with Christ is out of fear because, I mean, if I think about the, my progression with the relationship that I've had with Jesus Christ and my heavenly father, I can honestly say that at the beginning it was, it was like, you did things out of fear because you don't want to get in trouble, right? And so, but as time goes on, that relationship morphs into awesome relationship. And like, you know, you know his character better. And I feel like now he's like such a merciful, uh, or they're such merciful gods that like, I don't think that they would ever do anything to purposely hurt us or anything like everything that they do is for our benefit for our progression and if there's a consequence that that has to be uh divvied out um it's because of my action that i took towards that consequence if that makes any sense um there's this book from sister emily bell freeman i really love her um, and I've loved her since before she was our general young women president uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she, this book is called From Grace to Charity. And there's a part that she is talking about. And it is, let me see if I can, it is, she's talking about the woman at the well. And, um, and she talks about the interaction that Christ had with her 
And I really like the way that she put it. So let me just read like a little excerpt because it's so good. She says, he is a Jew asking for help from a Samaritan. Suddenly, this was more than just hospitality. The building of trust had begun. Her greatest lack was her belief in herself. If you knew who I was, she begins the conversation, a woman from Samaria, but less than the other Samaritans, it is almost as if she is implying that he chose the wrong well, the wrong woman. Right? Sometimes we feel that. Sometimes we feel that we're not enough, right? And then this part is so good. If thou knewest who it, who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. If you knew who I was, is his immediate reply. He offered transformation, a new way of living, a perspective that could change everything for her. He is not afraid to enter into the messy places, the places she doesn't trust to anyone. And I thought of this same interaction with the talents, like he was afraid of the master that he didn't know. And um, therefore he hid what he thought was um, something that the master could take back whole, right? Um, but that's not what he wanted. He, the master wouldn't want that back, right? He doesn't want it the way that it is. Like he could just have kept the money. Why would he have given it to anyone in the first place if it was just going to stay the same? And I love, and I love that his immediate reply was not that if you knew who I was, but it was if you knew, or if you knew who she was, right? But it was if, if she knew who he was, like then you would act differently. If we know Christ, we would act differently. And I think that's so important for us to remember that if we know Christ, we will act differently. And I think that the two servants at the beginning, um, the first two, the one with the 10 talents and then the one with the four talents, they knew Christ on a different level and they knew that they could put it to work. And they probably knew that if they put it to work and they didn't get back what they wanted or they didn't, figure out a way to do it like that Christ would understand, you know, the situation. But then that the third servant who hid, who hid himself from blessing others and from using his, those talents to help others that, uh, that, that he didn't know that he didn't know that he could use that he didn't know that the Lord would be so forgiving of um, that humanness. Like, you know, the, like he didn't know that he, that it would be okay to just try, you know, like you're not even trying. Like, that's the thing. I think, I think that was the thing too. Like he didn't even try to make anything out of it. He was just like, I'm going to put this away. Right. And that is part of like uh, my crush framework that I've come up with. So it's like the, C stands for connect with Christ. The R stands for remember who we are. Re remember to recite. And then the U stands for uncover those gifts, those God-given gifts, talents, skills, those experiences that the Lord has given us because he knows who we are and because he knows what we're going through. He has given the, us the, the gifts that we need to bless people's lives. And as we do that, we are fighting and we are able to, S, sharpen the sword, practice within our comfort zone, and then H, heed those promptings that the Lord gives us. And he's going to help us accomplish those hard things with those gifts because he knows how important it is for us to be able to do that and for us to be able to um, fight back. Because that, that's because Satan hates it when we serve God, right? And we're serve, when we serve others, we serve God. And so that is how we crush Satan. And so if we're not using our skills and our talents, we're, then we're not able to fight the adversary in the way that we have been um, entrusted to, the way that we have been armed to do. And we're just not using all of those resources at our disposal. And then we can we can fall. We can falter and we can, in the end, like we'll just not be able to survive. And you know what President Nelson says, that, we, that we're that we not going to be able to survive unless we are able to 
um, stay with the Holy Ghost as our constant companion. And the only way to have our, the Holy Ghost as our constant companion is to continue to connect with Christ, remember who we are, and then use those gifts and talents and uncover those and use the Lord's help to uncover those. So, um, anyways, now I wanted to read the Living Christ. Give me one second. Okay, so now we're going to read the Living Christ. And it says, oh, actually, first, <laughs> so many things, right? Because, okay, so the Come Follow Me manual has other things that we can focus on. They don't break it down in uh, per day, but that's okay. And... It says, the ancient apostles were bold in their testimonies of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Millions of people believe in Jesus Christ and try to follow him. And try to follow him because of their words recorded in the Bible. Yet some people might wonder if Jesus Christ is the savior of the whole world when they, oh, if, the, if Jesus Christ is the savior of the whole world, then why were his eyewitnesses limited to a handful of people in one small region? Now, we, um, we love the Book of Mormon, but we have been, you know, making space for Easter, uh, for this Easter week during our reading. And it says that the Book of Mormon stands as an additional convincing witness that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, manifesting himself unto all nations, is what it says in the title page of the Book of Mormon, and offering salvation to all who come unto him. In addition, this second witness also makes it clear what salvation means. This is why Nephi, Jacob, Mormon, and all the prophets labored so diligently to engrave in these words upon the plates to declare to future generations that they too knew of Christ and had a hope of his glory. So um, this Easter season, we're going to reflect on um, some of those teachings that we, that we covered, but we're also going to reflect on the testimony of the apostles. And this is the Living Christ, and I will put a link in the living uh, in the description to the Living Christ document uh, PDF, so that you can have access to it too. And it's easy to print, super easy to just download. Okay, so it says the Living Christ, the testimony of the the apostles, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Um. And it's just great to like be able to review the living Christ. Okay, here we go. Might get emotional because this is this is this is this is the living Christ talking. Yes, Miss. And we're bringing our tissues over because you know how it is. Okay, as we commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ two millennia ago, we offer our testimony of the reality of His matchless life and the infinite virtue of his great atoning sacrifice. None other has had so profound an influence upon all who have lived and will yet live upon the earth. He was the great Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Messiah of the New. Under the direction of his father, he was the creator of the earth. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Though sinless, he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He went about doing good, yet he was despised for it. His gospel was a message of peace and goodwill. He entreated all to follow his example. He walked the roads of Palestine, healing the sick, causing the blind to see, and raising the dead. He taught the truths of eternity and the real or the, he taught the truths of eternity, the reality of our premortal existence, the purpose of our life on earth, and the potential for the sons and daughters of God in the life to come. He instituted the sacrament as a reminder of his great atoning sacrifice. He was arrested and condemned on spurious charges, convicted to satisfy a mob, and sentenced to die on Calvary's cross. He gave his life to atone for the sins of all mankind. His was a great vicarious gift in behalf of all who would ever live upon the earth. We solemnly testify that his life, which is central to all human history, neither began in Bethlehem nor concluded on Calvary. He was the firstborn of the Father, the only begotten Son in the flesh, the Redeemer of the world. He rose from the grave to become the first fruits of them that slept. As risen Lord, he visited among those he had loved in life. He also ministered among his other sheep. 
in ancient America. In the modern world, he and his father appeared to the boy Joseph Smith, ushering in the long-promised dispensation of the fullness of times. Of the living Christ, the prophet Joseph wrote, his eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of rushing of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Of him the prophet also declared, and now after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters of God. We declare in words of solemnity that his priesthood and his church have been restored upon the earth. Built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, that we testify that he will someday return to earth and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. He will rule as king of kings and reign as lord of lords, and every knee shall bend and every tongue shall speak in worship before him. Each of us will stand to be judged of him according to our works and the desires of our hearts. We bear testimony as his duly ordained apostles that Jesus is the living Christ, the immortal son of God. He is the great King Emmanuel who stands today on the right hand of his father. He is the light, the life, and the hope of the world. His way is the path that leads to happiness in this life and eternal life in the world to come. God be thanked for the matchless gift of his divine son. End quote. Wow. <sighs> that was powerful. And I'm so glad that I was able to contain myself. Okay. Um, so this is... The first presidency signed this. It says Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson, James E. Faust. And then the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I want to hear it. Hold on, miss. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles is Boyd K. Packer, L. Tom Perry. Uh, can't read that one. Hmm. We're going to have to figure that one. This one's Neil A. Maxwell, Russell M. Nelson. Dallin H. Oaks, M. Russell Ballard, Joseph B. Worthlin, Richard G. Scott, mm, Elder Hales, <laughs> Jeffrey R. Holland, Henry B. Irene, well, and Henry B. Irene. Okay, but I'm still working on this one. Who's this one? Oh, David B. Haight? That one's David B. Haight. Whoa, that's crazy. Okay, so this was from the year 2000, so that makes sense. Um, January 1st, 2000. Um, Robert B. Hills. How did I forget his name was Robert? <laughs> so funny. Okay, I was actually trying to think of his name the other day, and I couldn't think of his first name. Um, okay, David B. Haight. That's got to be it, because... Hate. Yep with a ght anyways that's the living christ for us and you can print it out at home something else that i printed out for my family that i need to put together on this little fun thing is these things from the redheaded hostess they have like this little kit that you can uh download that's part of their study guide subscription it's so fun um so i need to put it in order because we have Palm Sunday first, then it's Monday, the cleansing of the temple. And then we have Tuesday, which is Teachings Tuesday. Teachings Tuesday, which we did yesterday. Then we have Worship Wednesday, also some of his greatest commandments. Thursday, his sacrifice begins, Thoughtful Thursday. Faust was actually impressed with all of the uh, alliterations I could figure out for each day. Friday, the Q crucifixion, Faithful Friday. Saturday, the tomb, which is spiritual Saturday or sacred Saturday. Okay. 
And then Easter Sunday, which is Sabbath Sunday, right? And Monday was, what do I call Monday? Because here in Utah, I actually could go to the temple on Mondays. And I called it, what did I call it? Mm, motivational Monday? No. Memorable Mondays? Miracle Mondays. That's what I called it. <laughs> of course, there's Temple Tuesday, but Teaching Tuesday, too. So I need to put these on this string, and then I was going to hang it up, and it would be so fun. Um, okay, so that is it for today. Let's read our Read It, Live It for you, because I, I love their challenges so much, or they're like, think they're thoughtful questions, right? So it says, from paragraph two, Jesus went about doing good, sharing a message of peace and goodwill. So this was, they take their uh, Read It, Live It from the Living Christ. And it says, send a message of peace to someone you love. Mm, I love that. And I just remembered that I forgot to send a text to my sisters yesterday. So I'm going to be doing that today. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for being here. And thanks for putting up with my sleepiness. You're amazing. And I appreciate you being my study, my gospel study partner, my uh, Book of Mormon reading buddy my warrior sister. Thanks for being here. Stay strong, warrior.